This recording, we're going to look at the summer 18 question two, focused particularly on working capital management. So again, this is a 20 marker question, which is the, the size of all the questions. Uh, 20 marks, remember now you have 180 minutes to do the exam, three hours. So you probably take off maybe 10 minutes as a buffer, 170 minutes across 100 marks, 1.7 minutes a mark. So multiply that by 20, you have about 34, 35 minutes to do a question like this. First part is calculate the combined impact of proposed changes will have in the cash position in ASH and whether they should uh, proceed. All right, so combine proposed changes. So you'll see up here, this is to do with trade receivables. Hopefully you've read through the question already. Um, four marks, four sources of information which will be useful uh, in evaluating the credit worthiness of a potential new customer. What is an aged analysis of receivables? And watch the and there and list two benefits it may provide to management. And then the last part D is calculate the EOQ and watch the AND again. Don't lose out on easy marks. Explain its significance. And three benefits would arise from the implementation of just in time, JIT. So notice the way there, they didn't tell you what JIT stood for. They expect you to know what just in time is, but it's mentioned up here as well. All right, so that's a core part of your inventory section. So 20 marks overall. But there was four plus three plus three that is 10 marks going for theory and then six and four is 10 marks going for calculations as well so I'm trying to show you here theory will be important in your cap one finance exam don't neglect it and you can even start with part b and part c if you want it to get marks in the board because it doesn't link to part a or part d so be be strategic in terms of your sequencing as well to make sure you get the most marks you can uh, in the time required. So I'm assuming you've read through the question. Essentially here, what you're looking at is Nash is thinking about changing its trade receivables policy. Right? The current details, it allows 30 days on credit, but because they're not following up, people are actually taking 50 days. So it's taking you 50 days to get the money in once you make the sale. You have your bad debts, you're given your sales and you're given your overdraft rate. And they tell you the order costs and the inventory holding costs, not for trade receivables, but that's for the EOQ model, which will come in part D. So, and to improve the liquidity, because of course liquidity, the cash flow position is part of working capital management. They're relaxing the credit period from 30 to 45 days, but they're gonna strictly enforce it, All right? Sales are gonna grow by 5% because you're reducing, uh, you're increasing your credit period. You're gonna hire new staff and bad debts are gonna fall as a result. So they're gonna go from 1.75% down to 1.5. You're gonna have more admin costs, but variable costs will not, not change, they'll be 75%. So again, ask yourself, why am I told variable costs? What if this is a standard type trade receivable question where you have to do a cost benefit analysis out. And then you're told, they want the cost associated with inventory to be reduced and they're looking at just in time. And that's gonna to relate to your part D. So your first part is to look at the impact that will have the cash position and make a recommendation. This is gonna be a cost benefit analysis. Part A, trade receivable policy, you're doing a cost benefit. What are the additional costs? What are the additional benefits? And all you do is list them down in a nice neat order and show the examiner which one outweighs the other. So in our case here, what we're thinking of doing is, we're thinking of changing our policy. So take the easy ones first. You're gonna hire new staff and you're gonna spend new admin costs. So both of those are easy. Hire new staff. That is going to be an extra 65,000 minus 65. And you're gonna have admin costs. So we're just looking at the incremental costs, the incremental benefits. You could lay it out differently, but you're going to get the same answer either way. And this is just a tad quicker and easier to understand. Admin costs, an extra 25. So don't be afraid to slot in the easy ones straight away. What else do we have? So we're told here, we leave the trade receivable move until the end because it's the hardest. We're going to increase our sales. Increase sales. Now, what a lot of students would do here is they will say the increase in sales is 5%. So they'll put 1.2 million times 10 euro, which is the current sales, times one point, or times 0 0.05 to grow it at 5%. And 
and they would have put in 600,000. Now, the key point is here, you shouldn't be looking at increased sales. It should be increased contribution. Because remember, if you have increasing in sales, you also have increased variable costs. So what actually the only net benefit you're getting is the 25%, which is your sales less your variable cost. So the increase in contribution, you multiply the increase in sales by 25%, which is what's left over after you spend the money on the variable cost. So that's always why you're given quite a standard one in a lot of past exam questions on trade receivables. Let's just make sure you understand that logic and don't get caught out. So that is 150,000. And we'll show you that as a little formula to one side in case you're looking for it again. So an increase of 150. You're going to have a movement in bad debts. You're going to have existing and new. The existing bad debt you're told is 1.75% of sales. So that's 1.2 million units at a 10 or a unit and 1.75 bad debts. So the current bad debts are 210. We just want to know, is it a movement up or down? Because we want to look at the incremental cost, the incremental benefit. The new bad debt is going to be 1.5% of total sales. This is where you have to be careful. Your new sales will be 1.2 million times 10 times 1.05. Because remember, they're going to be 5% bigger than before. And then you take 0 0.015 of that. Now that's tricky to watch for. That's the existing sales, which is 12 million. You grow that at 5% to get your new sales, and then you get 1.5% of it. So it's actually a saving, a reduction, which is a saving in bad debts. So that's why it's a positive one, because you're actually saving money. By employing these people, you're going to have less people not paying you, so you're better off by 21,000. And they are all euro figures. So a lot of those should be straightforward enough. There's no discount here that we need to consider. That's, that's not the policy they've gone with. But there is one we've ignored and we've left till the end. And that is, what about the trade receivables? Surely if we change the trade receivable policy, why am I told what the overdraft rate, draft rate is? Why am I told the policy? So we need to look as well at the movement in trade receivables. This is where students often lose marks because they don't understand it. By increasing or decreasing your average trade receivables, that's going to have a financing cost associated with it. The existing trade receivables will be based on 50 days, because that's what the current average days to pay is. So that will be 1.2 million units at 10 euro, means there's 12 million sales, divide by 365 times 50. So the existing average trade receivable balance based on 12 million euro and 50 days is 1.6 million euro. The new proposed, you're told, is going to be 45 days credit flat. Right. Now, technically here, and this is important to note, i just put a little asterisk here, could also take off bad debts first. So I would accept, and you'll see it in other solutions, if you did this, but instead of taking 12 million, you said it's 12 million times, what we're told, 1.75 times 0.9825. So you said, before you calculate the trade receivable, you take off the bad debt, which is 1.75%. So if you did that and accounted for the bad debt, or if there was a discount, you took that off, you get full marks as well. So there is a bit of ambiguity there. Just stick to whichever one. The solution, follow the one excluding it. That's fine. But both are acceptable. In the new one, you're told 45 days. So it'll be 12 million is the current revenue times 1.05. Because remember, your uh, revenue is going up in the new scenario by 5%. So the actual new revenue will be 12.6 million. And you divide by 365 times 45. Now, again, if you want to, you could put brackets there and say it's 12 million 
times 0.985 to take off the bad debt as well you get full marks so there is a bit of ambiguity stick with one approach but you can also flag to the examiner i know i could do it somewhere else some different way just to be consistent and that is 1.5 so that is a reduction in trade receivables of 90,000 just under 90,000 and remember now it's not that is not your cash saving the saving is the interest so the finance cost saving that's where some students go wrong you will save having to pay interest on that 90,000 because you get it in quicker so the actual saving there is that times 10 percent so you're saving there 9,000 so if you go back where to get the 10 percent you're told the overdraft rate is 10 percent so you're financing your working capital investment at 10 percent by having less trade receivables now in the new policy you have less of a financing cost and all you do then is you tot them up you say nine saving plus 21 plus a positive 150 and you take off the two negatives which is the increased investment and you can see here there is a net benefit so in this case the new policy makes sense so remember to get your last mark at the very end which they asked you and advise nash whether it should proceed that's worth a mark you're saying they should proceed because it's a net benefit you could if you want to come up with slightly different answers here same calculation overall though you'll get your same conclusion if you want to take off the bad debts but off the 12 million or off the 12.6 million here you'll get a slightly different answer but it will still come to the same conclusion so don't be too concerned about that it's a minor issue overall so that's your first requirement it was six marks so you have about there we'll say 1.7 or 1.6 minutes per mark about 10 minutes to do something like that but quite predictable in terms of how they uh, examine trade receivables the next two part b and c i said you could have done at the start if you wanted to get them out of the way and get some marks on the board four marks four sources which may be used by nash in evaluating the credit worthiness of a customer there's loads to be accepted here you could look for trade references so ask them customer for uh, references from people they've bought off on credit before you might ask for a bank reference uh, to make sure that they're not behind in any loans you might ask for their financial statements you might ask for their cash flow statement you could also give them a small amount of credit and use that as a source of information to so say if they if they pay that they pay it on time then you'll give them more credit afterwards so there's a whole host of acceptable answers but just watch the marks four sources four marks all we're looking for short bullet points look at the solution here as well if you come back it's a short snappy bullet point is what they're looking for nothing more than that list four maybe five just to be safe and move on and generally that was answered very well the calculations were very poor a lot of students couldn't do the calculations here so make sure you go back and look at your trade receivables similarly an aged analysis of receivables what is it and two benefits so what an aged analysis of receivables is it looks something like this you have a list down for example customer x customer y customer z a b and c and you have for example 0 to 30 31 to 60 61 to 90 and they might say 90 plus then so essentially what happens is you list out what every customer owes you and you figure out how much do they owe me that's due within the last 30 days how much is due that's owed for over 90 days and then you get your total as well so the big benefit of this is you can figure out how many people owe you money and it's owed for more than 90 days so why it's useful is the age analysis of debtors firstly it is what it says in the 10 it analyzes your total trade receivables based on how long they're owed why that's useful is it gives a very good summary quickly who the late payers are so it helps you identify quite quickly who your late payers are and how much is outstanding so they're a very useful way and you'll often see that if you end up auditing trade receivables are involved in trade receivables in the credit department that's a very important document which of course a lot of it is automated now uh, in accounting systems so it's three marks very nice seven marks there 
a lot less work to get those marks than to get the calculations. So remember, theory and Cap 1 finance can very much work in your favour if you put the study in uh, during your study leave. Next one, then the examiner mixed it up and looked for some inventory management knowledge as well. They asked you to calculate the EOQ, the current EOQ, and explain its significance. So here you're going to need the formula sheet, which you're going to be given in the exam. I've just taken the one from summer 2019, and it gives you the EOQ formula here, 2FU times C over CP, all of the square root. So again, you, while you are given the formula in the exam, you're not told what they stand for. F is the order cost per unit, or the order cost, should I say. U is the total demand for the year, and CP is the holding cost for the year. And you're given all of that in the question. Our demand, our U, 1.2 million units for the year. It's in units. Holding cost, 50 cent a unit. Order costs, 100 euro per order. And that's all you need to apply that formula. So the EOQ will be the square root of, in this case, 2 times 100 times 1.2 million divided by 50 cent. So if you work out that, the square root it has to be the square root of 2 times 100 times 1.2 million divided by 0.5. So you get the square root. Now that's a big figure. Let's see what it is. 480 million. Square root of 480 million. So the EOQ here, when you work it out, root 480 is going to be 21,909 units. So you have to round to one unit. You can't order a partial unit. So the EOQ here is about 22,000 units, 21,909. So what does that mean is, it means that's the optimal order quantity to minimize holding and ordering costs. That's what they ask. Because remember they asked them the question, what is its significance? Its significance is, if you order 21,909 every time, you will minimize the sum of all holding and ordering costs. So you're getting the best of both worlds. So the EOQ doesn't look at stock out costs and it doesn't look at purchase costs. But that was a nice three marks if you knew your formula and you knew how to apply it. Four marks even here. So there are nice short snappy ones, but you need to know your calculations. And the final one, three marks for just in time. This is where you only ever order inventory just in time to meet the demand. So you never have an inventory in stock, but it's very much relied on a good supply chain. Because if you have slow suppliers or poor quality, it's going to break down the whole thing. You're going to have unhappy customers and you're going to lose uh, business. So there's loads of benefits you could have put in. And you said here, most students had a good knowledge. Um, so they got good marks. We just look at the, how short and snappy the answers are. Look at page four, down the bottom. It reduces inventory levels because you don't actually hold stock. You only hold it when you need it. So you don't need that warehouse. You don't have to have money tied up in it. There's less waste because you only order in when you need it. right? And there's more responsibility taken by the supplier. Because again, you have to ensure that the supplier is going to be able to get you the goods in a quick and speedy manner. So it saves you investing in inventory, saves in warehouse costs, reduce defects, so a quicker supply chain. Uh, but it is very much reliant on having good suppliers. If you don't, the whole thing falls down quite quickly. So that was looking at summer 18 question two, a 20 marker compulsory question on working capital management, trade receivable calculations, uh, inventory calculations, but half of that was actually theory marks, which you could have done at the very start of the question and got those marks on the board.